singer, you make You Church, where we are a Jesus-centered community creating gracious space through acts of generous love. As always, a special welcome to anybody new who's logging on here this morning. This is a place that we want you to know that you are welcome here, and we are so glad that you have joined us to worship our God online with us this morning. Uh, friends, just a quick announcement before we continue in our service. Uh, for any youth parents out there or youth watching, we do not have youth this Thursday due to the BC Family Day long weekend. So we won't have youth this Thursday, but of course it will resume the following week. 
Friends, would you join me in prayer as I speak this prayer and call to worship over us this morning? So let's pray. It's good to be together, God, on these screens with these people, together listening for your voice, united by your spirit. In this time of worship, tell us about your kingdom of kindness so that we can seek it. Show us your justice. We want to walk with you humbly, closely, daily. Amen. Amen. Would you join us as we sing? Your love is like radiant diamonds bursting inside us. We cannot contain Your love will Surely come find us Like blazing wildfire Singing your name God of mercy Sweet love of mine Fly. 
your name. Well, hello, Coast Hills and friends, and welcome back to the kitchen here at our ministry center at Coast Hills Community Church, where we aspire to be a Jesus-centered community, creating gracious space through acts of generous love. We use our kitchen backdrop to remind us that we are trying to cook up some soul food for us here each and every week for our online service. So welcome, and thanks for joining us. Before we get into our topic to, or my sermon today, I want to um, update our church family on a conversation that we've been having for a few weeks with Young Life. It's a great organization that is doing some really good work with high school students here in Surrey, Cloverdale. Well, um, they were looking for a home to meet and do their midweek programming, and we just so happened to be just down the road from uh, Lord Tweedsmere, one of the local high schools here. And so we've been having some really good uh, conversations with them, and I'm very happy to say that starting this coming week, Young Life will be using our space. Um, our life group actually will be meeting on this side on Monday, uh, and Young Life will be will be on the other side. I think they're probably going to do. <laughs> I think they're doing dodgeball this ne- this first week, um, and it's a, a, a beautiful opportunity for uh, other organizations that um, that we love what they're doing to be able to use our space. In fall, we made a push to complete the other side of the ministry center, which is. Right now, it's kind of functioning like um, a partially unfinished basement. Um, It's usable, but it's not really inviting or warm or even completely functional. It's amazing, but we need to do some more work on it. So we made a commitment in fall that we would start the rentals. We wouldn't start the rentals until we received $20,000. Now, our goal is just under... 30000 for that space, but we made a commitment not to start the work until we have $20,000. Well, currently we're sitting at $13,428.78. So I want to thank everyone who's participated and been so generous with this project. So thank you. We're very close, actually, to hitting our $20,000 uh, kind of the money we need to start the rentals. So we're, we are um, just over $6,000 shy of that mark. So I want to ask us, um, those of you that are listening or watching and wondering if you could also be a part of what's happening. Maybe you already have. We want to thank you. Maybe you're like, maybe you're saying, hey, I can help push us even closer to that 20,000 mark. And if you're willing to help us reach that goal, uh, of $20,000 uh, to be able to make this space or the, this other space more inviting and functional. Um, I want to, uh, and, and possibly, uh, could possibly attract even more rental income and also um, not just rental income, but, but people in groups like Young Life that, um, that we share a common vision for work in our community, uh, that would be wonderful. Would you consider giving, giving to the Ministry Center Completion Project? And it's really simple. If you go to our website and on our Tithely, uh, the Tithely page, um, you just there's a drop-down menu and it says <clears throat> um, Ministry Completion Project, and you can give to that. We would love to see that get closer to the $20,000 as more and more people would be using this space. So thanks. Now, let's get to the teaching for this week. Today, I'm continuing our series that we've entitled, The Quiet Faithfulness of Following Jesus. And we're looking at all the fruit of the Spirit that, ju- that is in Galatians 5, to 23. These have been the anchor verses for our series. So would you read with me? Galatians 5, 22 and 23. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against these things there is no law. Now, we have three fruit of the Spirit 
yet to address. Love, joy, and self-control. Um, I think I'm pushing self-control to the end. That might be the hardest to be able to teach on. But today we're going to be looking at joy. Now, according to this passage, joy is a fruit that grows in and out of and reveals what God is doing by the Holy Spirit in the life of a Jesus follower. And it, it, it's like as we tend the inner parts of our lives and we partner with the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit plants these seeds of joy and other fruit in our lives that root in us and will eventually produce a fruit. Now, when we think of the notion of joy, many other words or expressions of joy come to mind. Gladness, happiness, laughter, delight, glee, cheer, and there's other, there's other of those positive words that relate to joy. And the opposite of joy <clears throat> is sadness, mourning, grief, misery, depression, sorrow, and suffering. <clears throat> I just want to say that sometimes in church culture over the years, there's been an overemphasis that we are to be joyful, that Christians participating in the church or that are coming to the expression of church, which is the gathered group, need to somehow have this happy, slappy attitude. And maybe not being willing to lean into and acknowledge and talk about and to address the harder things in life, such as suffering and sadness and grief and depression. And, and I think sometimes by not allowing that, this has been alienating for a lot of people. And in fact, maybe even really uh, alienating and, and, and has actually pushed people away. And for that, I want to say, as a leader in the church, capital C, but our particular, I'm, I'm sorry. But our church, we are trying to create gracious space and I would say in the last you know, several years and, and even the way that this church was planted is to bring the hope of the good news. But I also want to let us know that we cannot kind of push our, our humanity aside in the midst of this. Can I just say that it's, the human, it's, it's a human, it's very human to experience all of these feelings. And we don't want to somehow create a plastic, thin, veneer kind of culture that's unwilling to hold the tension of both joy and misery. So, if you're human, and I'm assuming that you are, welcome here. We hope that we are creating gracious space for you to be. Now, when we were talking about the fruit of the Spirit within our life group a few weeks ago, we pondered the question, this question, which of these fruit comes easiest for you? Or which of the fruit of the Spirit does it seem hard to live out? It was an interesting um, way to do this. I, you know, maybe if you're involved in a, in a life group or maybe your family, you could look at those verses in Galatians 5, 23 and 20, 22 and 23, and maybe you could just have that discussion as a family. Um, which is the fruit that's hardest for you? Which is the fruit that's easiest for you? What, what fruit do we uh, manifest the most here in our family? Which is the fruit that maybe we need to, to, to tend a bit more in our family? As I, comp contemplated, <clears throat> sorry, as I contemplated that question, the word joy kept jumping out at me. You see, when I was younger, my natural attitude was one that was full of positivity and I was a really happy kid. Joy was, in a sense, came easy for me, or what I thought was joy. People would ask me why I was so happy and enjoying life so much. But then, as you get older, 
more of life happens. We experience more loss. We experience more hurt in our lives. And sometimes it even seems harder to experience true joy in our lives. Among other things, the deterioration of my knees, personally of my knees, and the constant pain that I've had over the last 10 years has literally robbed me of joy in my life. Not being able to do the things that I'm good at physically (laughs) or to do the things I love, like hiking a mountain. And so my age has, in a sense, been working on robbing my joy. (laughs) I don't know if that's true for some of you. I also know that uh, the experience of the loss of my mom to her battle of cancer 19 years ago stole some of my joy. And I also know that being hurt by people's actions and my reaction to those hurts has the potential to steal and rob joy from my life. In a sense, it's as we grow older, there is a chance that there is this constant loss of innocence in our lives can steal our joy. And yet, I'm thankful that as I grow older, I can also say that the joy that I've experienced now is much deeper. It's a bit more complex, and it's more meaningful now than the joy that would come from maybe just an adventure experience, or uh, maybe a new shiny toy, or something new that I've bought. I've had this joy. You know, sometimes um, when we're working through Um, sadness or we're feeling a little bit blah, our culture in North America, we sometimes want to buy our way towards joy. And I would say that over the pandemic, I think if I look and I'm kind of contemplating this now, uh, yeah, joy has been one thing that has been deteriorating in my life. And so I'm glad that this sermon is for me more than it is for you. And I'm thankful, though, that I have a faith that is revealed, I have faith in a God that is revealed to the world through the birth, life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. We have a faith in a God who wants to come and and came and experienced life that we experience as well. We have a God that is not, um, in a sense, um, cold to suffering or has not experienced the hardship of life. There's some verses in Hebrews, and the author writes this, Hebrews 4, 14 to 16 says, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith what we profess, for we do not have a high priest who's unable to empathize with our weaknesses. But we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. I'm experiencing joy as I read those verses. The good news is that we have a God who has revealed himself as one of us. Fully God, yet fully human. One who listens and hears us and can help us. As God can empathize and sympathize with us in our time of need. That there is joy. For us. It's the joy of the good news. And that same author in Hebrews writes of Jesus enduring suffering for joy, for the joy that was set before him. In Hebrews 12, verses 4 to 6, it says this We, followers of Jesus, we fix our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. 
For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. There was a joy that ran deeper than any suffering or circumstance that Jesus endured. And that joy for Jesus was to work towards the love of God being fully displayed for all of humanity through his death on the cross. And that love that God, that Jesus fully displayed for all of humanity was vindicated in the resurrection of Jesus. That death and suffering and sin do not have the final word. Love does. Because love resurrects. Love brings life. And so I am thankful that I have this faith in a God who is revealed in and through Jesus Christ. So joy is not necessarily dependent on on our circumstances. But it doesn't mean that we walk through our circumstances, our circumstances, again, like I said, with this thin veneer of this happy, slappy, oh, everything's okay, I'm smiling. <laughs> Robot. No, I can, I can enter into grief and misery. I can enter into the sadness. But there is this base note, in a sense, of joy. There is this root of joy. There is this, in a sense, this seed of joy that has been planted in us by the Holy Spirit through the love of Jesus. It's planted in us that at some point through the soil of sadness will grow in us and reveal joy in our lives and for other people. Um, Brian Zahn wrote, writes this, and it, it caught my attention this week. To cultivate joy that is not dependent on, upon accus, uh, acquisition or events is deeply Christian. It also subverts the powers who want to control everything, including our joy. The powers want to dictate when and why we can rejoice. And then sell it to us. Rebel and rejoice in the Lord. This is the scandalous joy given to us by Jesus. It, it kind of speaks to that um, notion that I was saying earlier when um, we, we see that um, in North America, uh, we like, when we don't feel good, we we go and buy. We try to buy our joy. We love all the parcels and the packages from Amazon showing up at our doorstep. And we also think that maybe if our circumstances could change in a way, I would just then be joyful. Now, there's a bit of truth to that. But I've had the opportunity in different ways and uh, to visit friends and, uh, that are in Africa and Paraguay and Mexico that simply are more joyful than a lot of people in North America and they really don't have a lot of stuff. And their circumstances look a lot more dire than ours. And yet somehow their faith in Jesus and their fruit of joy is abundant and bearing. I want to share a couple stories about how this tension of uh, suffering and joy can be lived out for us. Um, I want to share a picture with you. It's a picture of Sharon and her good friend, Linda. Now, this picture that you'll see here was taken a few weeks before Linda's battle with brain cancer ended. In fact, her husband, Dave, took this picture of Sharon and Linda. 
What I love about this picture is that it captures the deep relationship of Sharon and Linda's friendship. And it holds the tension between suffering and joy. It is hard to see, but Sharon has this full smile on her face. And I know my wife's smile when she has that smile. And, and there's creases that scrunch up on her in her eyes. It's, it's because her face is so full of her smile that her eyes are lit up. And, and it's as if she wants to, for Linda to see her joy in being present with her. And as she's holding Linda's uh, cheeks, and Linda has this calm, quiet smile of trust. And it's as if, as if Linda is saying, yes, Sharon, I will let you in this dark space with me. And I will not allow all of this sadness and darkness to overwhelm us. And so there's, in the midst of this suffering, both Sharon and Linda were able to look at each other with joy. A joy that goes much deeper than the suffering that Linda was enduring. Sharon said this to me. Joy is being able to see beauty in the world in the midst of the reality of pain. <laughs> My wife is full of wisdom. Let me repeat that. Joy is being able to see beauty in the world in the midst of the reality of pain. And <clears throat> last week, I, we had the opportunity to go to Whistler on a micro holiday. Uh, we had two nights on a killer deal uh, at the Fairmont. We would not have been able to, to go there unless we found this amazing deal. Now, because of my knee, I was unable to go skiing. So Sharon and the kids met up with friends for the day and skied. And I stayed back and made my way to the outdoor pools and hot tubs <clears throat> that were right on the bottom of the Blackcomb Ski Hill. As I was sitting there in the hot tub, it was strange because a lot of all kinds of emotions were hitting me all at once. And it's almost maybe because I had some time and space to think and to be present with my own emotions. Among the strongest emotions, there were two, joy and sadness. I was thinking about two parallel tracks. The first track, I was very sad for the loss of our good friend Linda. This was very fresh. We had just um, uh, had our graveside and then uh, were part of her um, her memorial service, that was, which was absolutely beautiful and sad all at once. But I, have, I was thinking about this, the very sad, I was overcome with sadness for the loss of, my good, of our good friend Linda and Sharon's good friend. It was very, very sad. And I was sitting there weeping in the midst of grief. But then I caught myself smiling for some strange reason. And as I sat there with tears in my eyes, and a smile on my face, I was overwhelmed by that same friendship that we had with Linda, of who she was or who she is actually, and how much we are richer in our friendship and our character and our love because of our relationship and our friendship with Linda and Dave and our godson, Jamie. And I just sat there experiencing both sadness and joy. But it seemed like joy was overwhelming me more than sadness. And I was so grateful for that. And then I was able to look at the beauty of the mountains. And this beautiful mountain vista of Blackholm. And I was thinking of how beautiful creation is and what a privilege it is that I'm able to see this beauty and the adventure that it holds for my family that was on the ski hill at the time. 
And I would have loved to be on the mountain skiing, but my knee held me back. And it was only because of that kind of suffering, not being able to be on the mountain, that allowed me to experience this particular moment that I was so very grateful for. And then again, I was filled with joy in the midst of my own sadness of not being able to participate. And so I, I, I'm glad that I'm getting to this point where I can hold those in tension. And I wonder if that is what God is asking us to do and asking us to work through. I wonder if we simply need to be reminded that in the midst of life, there can be, actually, eventually there will be a lot of suffering and sadness. Yet, we are able to, in and I would say participation with the Holy Spirit, tend to the inner parts of our lives so that joy might be a sweet fruit that we could bear to the world. A fruit that would be planted in the soil of maybe sadness. And through the mystery of the resurrection, it will not die because of the work and the witness of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit in our lives. And so that is my hope for you, to be able to tend maybe the soil of sadness and ask the Holy Spirit to plant the seed of joy in your life, that you're able to have the joy spring up in the midst of whatever you might be suffering from or experiencing sadness from right now. Um, if you want to talk more about this beautiful mystery of God's love revealed in Jesus Christ, we'd be more than happy to do that. My email is really easy to find. You go to our website, kevin at coasthillschurch.com. Um, I hope that you can have these discussions in your life groups, maybe in your family. Um, and I want to encourage us to do that. Um, I also want to say that um, this, there's, there's appropriate times for um, medical intervention and, um, and uh, um, you know, proper use of, of medication that can help us in this way. Um, there's no way that I'm trying to, uh, to steer us around that. And so that's a whole other discussion. But I, I hope that you're able to see and tend, that, you, that we can tend to um, the inner parts of our lives. I want to um, highlight something for us. Um, a friend of mine, and many of you would, will, will know him, um, is David Fretter. And uh, I've known him for <laughs> so many years. Um, must be close to 18 years. I don't know. Dave, how long have I known you? Maybe 20. Um, and I just want to highlight a, a book that he's written. It's called Joy and Misery. Um, poems by, David, by, D. Fret, by D. Fretter. And uh, I, he, it just came out and I ordered it on Amazon and got it shipped to me. And... Um, and I just want to uh, highlight uh, one of the poems in here uh, that speaks to some of this. And I love the fact that, that, that David has put together joy and misery and uh, kind of living in that tension. Um, and because I don't have my glasses here right now, uh, it's in this book, but I have it on screen here that I'm going to read for us. It says this. The, the poem is called Roots. I would rather tend my roots not the blossoms or the leaves. I am always growing. You just can't see. And I think David has a word for us here. Let's not just tend, tend the outward appearance of who we are, but let's be people, Jesus followers, Christians, uh, humans, that tend the roots of our lives. And interestingly enough, do you know that over time, those roots can push 
up out of the surface and can bear beauty for the world and hopefully the fruit of joy. And so may God and your community be gracious towards you as you tend the roots so that joy may grow out of the soil of sadness. You made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them. Your promises remain. You give justice to the weak. You care for the widow and orphan. Forever, Lord, you reign. What joy! What joy for those whose hope is in the name of the Lord. What peace, what peace for those whose confidence is Him alone. What joy, what joy for those whose hope is in the name of the Lord. What peace, what peace for those whose confidence is Him alone. Well, friends, thank you for being here. Uh, would you receive this benediction? May the God of hope fill you up with joy, fill you up with peace, so that your lives may be filled with the life-giving energy of the Holy Spirit. And may you brim over with joy 
The kind of joy that is not afraid of suffering or sadness. Peace to you. And we hope to see you here next week.
gracious to 